This episode is brought to you by Fully Gemstones. Whenever the Duchess went abroad, they used to get all the jewels out of the bank and they would spread them out over the Duchess's bed in her bedroom in the Bois de Boulogne. And it looked like an Aladdin's cave. And then Maria the Maid would come in with a blue dress, which the Duchess was going to take with her. And then the Duchess would select which jewels she thought would be appropriate for that. And those jewels would be insured and all the other jewels went back into the bank again. Welcome to If Jewels Could Talk. I'm Carol Walton, the voice of jewellery an author, broadcaster, and the woman who initiated the role of jewellery editor at magazines like Tatler and British Vogue. This is a podcast for everyone, for people who do like jewellery, for people who don't realise they like jewellery, and anyone intrigued by fascinating facts, new ideas, and forgotten histories. So please join me as I tell sparkly tales, meeting all sorts of people, delving into four centuries of jewellery culture, and investigate what's happening now. We have a change of episode today by order of Buckingham Palace, no less, because there's some things we were going to talk about this week that they haven't released yet. So we're holding on to that one. We will be taking you into Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle in a future episode. But we're sticking with our royal theme this week in Platinum Jubilee Week. We are delighted to be talking with the award-winning historian, author and broadcaster, Hugo Vickers. Today, we're going to talk about the American divorced socialite who captured the heart of a prince. No, not that one. We're talking about the Duchess of Windsor, for whom Edward VIII abdicated the British throne and they married in June 1937. And I'm going to talk about her life and her jewels with the award-winning historian, broadcaster and author who's written biographies on many of the 20th century's leading figures, including the Duke and Duchess of Windsor in his book, The Private World of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, and Behind Closed Doors, about the rather sad last 10 years of the Duchess when she was effectively coercive controlled by her lawyer, but more about that later. Sir Winston Churchill said in 1948, the Duke's love for her is one of the great loves of history and arguably more than any other love story, it's been told through jewellery. Hugo, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. It's a pleasure. And you are somebody who knows this story so intimately. You visited their 19th century houseman mansion in the Bois de Boulogne, both when the Duke was alive And when he died, you have visited it numerous times. You've written widely on the subject. You actually own part of the Duchess's jewels inventory. But the first thing I want to know is, did you like the Duchess? Because she was quite a controversial figure. And I want to know your feelings about her because she divided opinion. Which side of the opinion are you on? Well, it's rather interesting because I would say, like everybody else, I was brought up to think that the Duchess of Windsor was a bad person. You know, by me, my parents spoke rather disparagingly about her. And then one day in 1964, there was a photograph of her in the newspaper. I've still got it in the Sunday Express going around the World Fair in New York. And she looked perfectly nice. And I thought, first of all, I said, the very I was only 12 at the time or something. I thought, well... Amazing that they've taken a photograph of this woman, you know, and um, the Duke was sort of trailing along behind. And so I got interested in the story and I read quite a lot about it. And then I read his memoirs, I read her memoirs, and then they did the film of the King's story, the Duke of Windsor appeared in that. And of course, the Windsors, who'd been rather shadowy figures, began to come rather more into focus in the um, British world because, you know, they were invited over 1967 to the unveiling of the Queen Mary Memorial. And there were sort of more and more photographs of them. And and then, of course, the famous Kenneth Harris interview, which is the best interview with them, um, in which they both talk. I mean, she's really there to talk about life today. And then he trawls through his story. But, I mean, it's a very... And that was shown by the BBC. It was, and millions of people watched in. uh, Many, many more people than watched any of the other excellent Kenneth Harris interviews at that time. Uh, Of all the royal interviews, funnily enough, I think that was one of the most successful ones. It wasn't one of the ones that went wrong. Um, nobody criticised it, nothing awful came out of it. And you just got an interesting perspective on their life. And then suddenly I had this extraordinary good fortune to go to the house, um, by which time I was very much on the side of the Duchess of Windsor and thought that she was a, a wronged woman. And having thought about it 
for over 50 years now, nearly 60 years actually, my conclusion is that the world adored the Prince of Wales and thought he was absolutely wonderful in the 1920s and so on. Um, but people who knew him and worked for him had quite serious reservations about him. Whereas, as you know, the world loathed Mrs Simpson, but people who knew her and worked for her actually really rather liked her. And she was very straightforward. You know, Cecil Beaton, who's pretty spiky about a lot of people, said, you couldn't have a better friend than Mrs Simpson. You know, she was, I think we would have all enjoyed her. And I knew a lot of people who knew her. I used to obviously talk to them about her. Um, people like Diana Cooper, who said people sharpened up when she came into the room. She was very funny. You know, she was generous. She brought everybody into the conversation, didn't leave anybody out. She was, you know, she's a much maligned woman. But the trouble is, if you get involved in the abdication, people will just say anything about you. And so she was turned into the woman who stole the king, which I don't actually think she did. He was a king waiting to be taken out of that situation, do you think? He was the king waiting to take himself out of that situation, mm. I conclude. But I think if you woke him up at four in the morning and shook him and asked him that, he would deny it furiously. But I think, unless he's even stupider than I think he was, he must have realised that they weren't going to accept a woman with two husbands living as Queen of England. I mean, in a way, I think subconsciously, he found somebody with whom he could escape. And if you read the letters that were published you know, to Frieda Dudley Ward, there's endless endless evidence of him fed up, um, wanting to go, not wanting to be a part of it all, thinking the whole thing is a bore. And uh, it's just a very sad story and saga. Possibly the one mistake that she made, if you consider it to be a mistake, and this brings us back to the house and so forth, mm -hmm. is that what she did was she turned herself into the epitome of a royal duchess. I mean, she was more elegant than some extremely elegant royal duchesses we had in England, like Princess Marina and the Duchess of Gloucester. These were elegant women. The Duchess of Windsor was even more elegant than any of them. And she created a miniature court in exile for him. All the footmen were wearing livery. The, um, the whole house was full of coronets and evidence of a king in exile. Whereas Diana Cooper always said, you know, if I'd taken him on, I'd have taken him to Wyoming and let him be a cowboy, which is perhaps what he would have really liked to be. Or the beach in Montecito, perhaps. Well, I can <laughs> leave that one out of it, I think. <laughs> he was loved by the British people. He was. Um, but do you think quite a lot of the anti-Wallace feeling came through the late Queen Mother, Queen Elizabeth, because she was quoted as saying in your book, two people who've caused me the most trouble in my life are Wallace Simpson and Hitler. Well, that's a pretty horrible thing to say. I think it was very convenient for the Queen Mother to blame the Duchess of Windsor for taking him away. And here it gets quite complicated psychologically, because my theory is that when the Duke of York, Prince Albert, Prince Bertie, began to show an interest in her, and her mother began to think that she ought to be a royal bride, I mean, can you blame her for thinking, well, why go for the stammering second son when, you know, the very dashing um, eldest son and heir uh, is available? And I think that... She probably, I think she was rather very fond of, the, genuinely fond of the Prince of Wales. And I mean, I knew somebody who would now be about 120, who was at a party at Wilton in 1922 and saw the Prince of Wales and, the, and Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon sitting out together at this dance, which was for Patricia Herbert, later Lady Hambledon, who um, said, you know, you really might have supposed there was something going on. And I thought, help, when I was investigating this. Then what happened? Well, what happened after that was he headed off hunting somewhere else and she went back to London. The Duke of York wasn't at that party and then there was a bit of gossip in the paper about the possibility that the Prince of Wales might be taking on a, a Scottish bride and within a few minutes she was engaged to the Duke of York but she always had a very good conspiratorial and supportive relationship with her brother-in-law and nothing more than that but she 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 realised the problems that he had with George V. She's sympathetic to him. Because he had a very um, overbearing father. Yes, yeah, so, well, as, as certainly as perceived mm. by him. I mean, yes, mm. he did. Yes, he did. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, um, when he was king, she was able to get him to do a lot of things. She was much closer to him than the other sisters-in-law. And she could say to him, you know, darling David, the Red Cross are needing a visit. You know, might you oblige? And he did. You know, she, so she was very happy having him there like that. And, of course, she then 
blamed him very much for letting the side down, which is actually what the whole of England and the whole of the empire did. And his mother, Queen Mary. And his mother was, I mean, desperately upset and disappointed. I mean, terribly fond of him, but desperately upset. And, of course, off he went. And so they naturally blamed Mrs Simpson. And it was very convenient for her to blame her. But I personally think that Mrs Simpson was something of a victim in all this. And I don't think that... I think she loved being the friend of the king. And I don't mind what interpretation you put on the word friend, but it may not have been even more than that, funnily enough. She did not wish to be the wife of the exiled Duke of Windsor, a man who had absolutely nothing to do and whom she had then had to look after and live up to this myth of the great love story of the 20th century. Do you think it was a myth? I do think it was a myth, yes. I think he was obsessed by her. She was very magnetic and she was very kind of, I mean, people even much later in life, I mean, just to give you an example, when she, after the Duke died, she went to America a couple of times, I think, and um, she used to go by boat. And they never put her name... She didn't like flying, did she? No, she hated mm-hmm. flying. Um, they never put her, her name on the passenger list. And normally she had dinner in her cabin, but once or twice, just to keep her secretary happy, she would go into the dining room. And the secretary said the moment she walked into the dining room, the whole room was absolutely transfixed. And I, of course, said, well, they recognised her. She said, well, yeah, some people recognised her, but quite a lot of people didn't, but they knew she was somebody. Don't you think she was the complete antithesis of, as you say, Queen Elizabeth, um, the Queen Mother, the the English style of the gumboots, the scarf, the sensible coats, and there was this very thin, elegant, superbly dressed woman. Do you think he was attracted by the fact she was so different? Yes, I do. I think he loved America. He loved the newness of America. Um, I think that two types of people he admired most in life, according to his um, his actual private secretary, were American tycoons and uh, golfing pros. And so if you've got a, an American tycoon who played a good round of golf. The Duke was like a little boy in front of them and he admired them so much. He loved America. And I think so she was zippy, she was funny, she was sharp. She actually wasn't so particularly well-dressed when he first met her, but she jolly well became well-dressed. She sort of, and Cecil Beaton says it's quite extraordinary how she changed. I mean, her, her almost her whole physique changed and she's changed from being quite a, you know, sort of he calls her brawny at one point um, into this as you say, a sylph-like, elegant person. Who went to all the best couturiers. Yes. Givenchy, Chanel, Dior. It seems to me it was a sort of big moment of transition where his parents were very much in the old world and steeped in British tradition. And he was wanting to get with the modern world of cocktails, Cadillacs, change of clothes and, you know, loud checks. And it was this sort of moment of transition and she kind of represented that. Yes, I mean, he was was very stylish too, let's face it. I mean, uh, I remember his private secretary saying, you know, he could wear clothes that you you and I couldn't possibly wear, you know, and he gets away with it. I mean, these loud checks and things. Indeed, the Prince of Wales check has gone into the language and vernacular. Absolutely. As as has the Windsor Knot. As has the Windsor Knot, exactly. Which was how he tied his tie. Yes, he actually had it sort of made, built up in the in that mm. part of the tie as well. You know, he used to say that, um, he used to talk about the establishment and how the establishment was against him. And he, he said that um, he'd read an article saying, you know, Prince Philip wasn't part of the establishment and nor was what he said, nor was the Duke of Windsor, as he put it. You know, and he wasn't. And I think that was part of the problem. And, and the Duchess in that interview with Kenneth Harris says, you know, that they were so with it. That was part of the problem. They were so with it. They were sort of like ahead of their time in many ways. I, I'll just tell everyone listening that we're sitting in um, my office in London and Hugo is actually beneath a large portrait a photograph of the Duchess of Windsor, which I actually had framed. I was given by Sotheby's. They had them after the sale of her jewellery in, in the 1980s. And I framed this because she is sort of a jewellery heroine. And I obviously, I am influenced by Hugo's writings and his work. So I very much see her as this sort of maligned woman and the woman gets all the blame. I think unfairly, because also she, you know, she did, really did her best to look after him. He certainly at more delicious food in more beautiful surroundings in the second half of his life than he ever did in the first half. And in her funny American way, she tried her best to keep him interested, to keep him going, bring interesting people to the house. They travelled a lot. It's very easy to see it as all as being pointless. And there is an element of that. I mean, there's an element of two people caught in this awful situation whereby he has done this terrible thing of abdicating 
which is letting down his entire country, and he was reigning over two-thirds of the world's population, and he gives it up for this strange person, you know, this woman who's, what is what is she, you know? This is what they all thought, you know, some siren who's kind of captured him. But um, He captured her. I think he captured her. But after that, she really did look after him as well as possible. But it was a sad situation in many ways. I and mean, again, you know, I talked to a lot of people who knew, knew them, and the Duchess's Swiss secretary said, oh, wasn't it wonderful, whenever the Duchess was going to the hairdresser, she'd come down the stairs, that you could come down in the lift, and there he would be to see her into the car. And wasn't it also wonderful when she came back from the hairdresser, there he was on the doorstep to open the car door and um, see her into the house. And I thought, well, I know what she means, but that's very claustrophobic. I mean, if you really, if you want a spaniel, I mean, buy one, don't marry one, you know. He followed her around the house and... You know, he knew he'd put her into a terrible situation because he didn't get her received by his family. He didn't get her the HRH title, which he minded about very much more than she did. And he turned her into the most hated woman in the world. And that's an awful thing to have done. And I think she was quoted as saying, wasn't she, that all the sort of couture clothes, the jewels, the way she presented herself going to the hairdresser every day. She said, well, it's my job. That's what I can do for him for the rest of my life. When I walk into a room, he's got to be proud of me. And I think that's one of the saddest reasons to have this beautiful jewellery collection. Yes, I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right about that. I mean, she wanted to um, live up to him and be a, you know, as I say, she turned herself into the epitome of a royal duchess. I mean, better than all the other royal duchesses. But, you know, there was another sort of interesting thing, which was when they were at the mill, this house they had outside Paris, um, his private secretary told me that often they had guests and that was all fine, but occasionally they didn't. So they'd have dinner together, and then afterwards they'd go into the drawing room. They had nothing to say to each other, and they weren't tired enough to go to bed. And a decanter of of whiskey was brought in, and it just went down, down, down. And that's why John Utter, the private secretary, didn't write his memoirs, because he didn't, you know, didn't want to in any way (laughs) do what I'm doing now, in a space, which is to sort of slightly denigrate the idea of the great love story of the 20th century. I mean, they were caught in this awful situation, you know. But there's been no relationship ever that has been literally inscribed in jewellery in the way theirs has. And we have here the um, original hardback Sotheby's catalogue of the Duchess of Windsor sale of her jewellery, which was held in Geneva on the 2nd of April 1987. And in it, we can look at some of their jewels and trace this love story. I think the first ones, Hugo, that might be interesting to look at was some crosses Yes, well, the Duke was sort of forever giving her a little, I was going to say trinkets, but they're rather more than that, aren't they? Um, Gem set, made yes, by Cartier. <laughs> exactly, which recorded different moments in their lives and different anniversaries and so forth. I mean, he was very zealous at all this in sort of, uh, you know, recording the different anniversaries and special moments and so forth. You know, here you see these little things with inscriptions on them and lots of W's and E's interlocked and things we, like that. We too. We it's too. always about we Wallace and Edward. Yes. And dates. And dates, some dates that kind of you can't decipher. Something must have happened between them that was private. Which we don't know about, which is fine. But which is what it should be. Which is what it should be, exactly. Which is lovely, I think. And and um But these crosses particularly gave the love story away. But because it was when they saw the press followed the Duke and Duchess well the the then um He was then King King and Mrs. Simpson around but the British press did not blow the whistle on the romance and no one referred to it in the press until they saw these crosses on them both on a um, a boat that the Narlin. the Narlin well of course the British press actually of course didn't break it at all until they had to I mean, that was much much closer I mean, the, the American press and the other press of course they all everybody who traveled all knew about what was going on and the British it couldn't happen nowadays but it, it did I mean that there was the Lord Beaverbrook and the other newspaper magnates all sort of agreed not to print anything until the Bishop of Bradford made that speech and then out it came in fact you, you could argue that the British public knew nothing about it until it was pretty much over and nor did the Duke and Duchess of York the next King George VI and Queen Elizabeth and um, so beginning of December I, I think mm. really of 1936 they just didn't know the seriousness of it no and, and, and mm. the, in fact nobody was particularly concerned about Mrs Simpson until she instituted divorce proceedings against Mr Simpson because at that point there was no fear of them actually getting married but the moment that happened whoops you mm. know That was getting dangerous. And then, of course, to his credit, the king knew that the coronation in May 1937, he would have to take the coronation oath, which would effectively prevent him from marrying her. 
Um, so he needed, in a way, to sort it all out before then. That, In that sense, he's honourable. And actually, I would say he abdicated quite honourably, quietly, without an enormous amount of fuss. He didn't fight his corner. Well, he didn't want to fight his corner, did he? Because he wanted to go. But um, Churchill kept trying to persuade him to. And then off they went. And unfortunately, after that, he was rather less uh, admirable because having gone... In a sense, he wanted to come back again and reinvent himself as a younger brother of the king on his own terms. And what he didn't realise was the British nation was fed up and upset by what had happened. And you can't have two kings, especially yeah. when you've got a charismatic ex-king and a rather stammering other new king who's finding his feet, who did find his feet quite quickly, but it took time. It did yes. take a certain amount of time. It would have, you would have had two rival courts. Absolutely, really. it would have been tra- yes. tra- absolutely hopeless. Yeah. But I love the idea that this was really what, it was jewellery that, that cemented the idea in the press's mind that this was something to contend with and this yes. was serious. I think that you could say that, I mean, I think Sydney at the house used to talk about the pugs being like their children, you know, the children that they never had. And the jewellery is a sort of um, affirmation of the Duke's love for her isn't it? At every turn, he's giving her more and more wonderful things. Do you think he's also setting up that he couldn't get her the HRH title? She said, a tiara is one thing I'll crown, is one thing I'll never have. So he compensated giving yes, her what hugely. was their crown jewels. Yes. I mean, in fact, of course, you could argue that the collection, as we saw it, I mean, did, I, did you go to Geneva? I went to no, Geneva to no. see it. Um, and was lucky enough to um, hold some of the pieces at the time and because I went with a man called Paul Louis Valère who was quite capable of buying some of the things and so I was then allowed to you know they thought I was probably going to be bidding on his behalf or something so I was allowed to go by and you know some of the some of the uh, necklaces um, uh, actually still had powder you know from her wearing them you're better expert on the actual thing they're pale blue those very pale blue uh, um the Charles Sedany beads yes that's those ones that were made by um Suzanne Belperon that's it yes. and uh, there was a particular Wallace blue there was that yes. all the couturiers because she had this unerring sense of style and she had very blue eyes so the they literally, Dior invented the Wallace Blue, yes. which had a sort of lavender, and uh, yes. Suzanne Belperon then created it using Charles Sedany's stones. But I have a slight theory that the, the, the Duchess became more of a jewellery icon um, after death than she did while she was still alive, because, for example, the Flamingo, mm-hmm. which is so fabulous, I mean, that became so iconic to her. But um, we only see about four or five pictures of her wearing it, because it was quite a chunky thing. This was a large flamingo with um, incredible... With articulated um, legs, by the way. Articulated legs and incredible bright gem set feathers. But it was very big, wasn't it? It was, and she didn't wear it that often. Mm. Um, And so uh, it's when you see the collection as a whole that it's so amazing. But now what I can tell you is that whenever the Duchess went abroad, they used to get all the jewels out of the bank. And they would spread them out over the Duchess's bed in her bedroom in the Bois de Boulogne. And it looked like an Aladdin's cave. And then Maria the maid would come in with her blue dress, you know, on a hanger, which the Duchess was going to take with her. And then the Duchess would select which jewels she thought would be appropriate for that. And those jewels would be insured and all the other jewels went back into the bank again. And um, must have been quite a fantastic... Quite a performance. Quite a performance. And then when she was on these trips on these boats going across the Atlantic, quite stressful looking after all the jewels... Do you think she loved jewellery? Did she love jewellery? I think she did. I think she did. I think, as you say, it was a compensation, really. And it was a sort of affirmation of the love story. And it's a, I mean, it's a fantastic way of doing it. But we know she loved jewels, don't we? Because Van Cleef and Arpels, I mean, you're much more of an expert on jewels than I am. But didn't she invent the zip? She um, did. You know, which is which was in, in diamonds? Um, that was in diamonds. And it's a sort I've of feat of engineering yes. that she worked with um, René Poussin, the designer at Bank yes. of Arpels. But I, I often wondered, and I wanted to ask you this, Hugo, because the Duke worked closely with Jean Toussaint at Cartier. The Duchess had these ideas of creating, she wanted the zip made in precious stones. And I wondered, do you think actually she, she had a design sense that she, oh, yes. she she could have taken that in another world and actually had a job? Well, she, she says in the Kenneth Harris interview that she would have loved to have run an advertising agency. I think she would have been, she was extremely efficient. And, of course, she ran the house absolutely beautifully. And what Monsieur Martin said, uh, who was in the house, um, and he's actually still in the house when she, when she died, I mean, all those years later, um, Georges was the head butler, Monsieur Martin, and Maria was married to Maria the maid. He said, up until the time the Duke died, she knew everything. In other words, 
if somebody dropped a spoon or a plate in the mill, she by, by radar, she sort of knew about it. And then after the Duke died, she knew nothing. Because in a sense, I don't think she had to continually perpetuate this myth anymore. And she wasn't very well when he died, and then she just lost it after that. So, I mean, this efficiency, she used to say to the staff, you know, if you, if you drop something, break it tell me immediately, because she knew they didn't necessarily do it on purpose. But what you don't want, your cleaning lady, you go up to a piece of porcelain and you, and it falls apart because they've placed it together again. You know, she just wanted to know about it. I mean, she's very straightforward. And so, yes, I think she's, she w could easily have been a very important um, ambassador for jewels. I mean, the Van Cleef pieces are beautiful, are they not? They kind of created a new style. It's yes. kind of 40s, 50s, exuberant, yes. colourful, very design-led. I mean, that... That wasn't the style before. So I think working with these fine jewellery houses as great patrons, yes. they really affected um, the culture of, of jewellery. But I remember somebody saying, um, he knew a lot about jewels and the ladies who wore these jewels, that, that men of Bismarck's jewels were all very, very soft because she was a very soft beauty. Whereas the Duchess of Windsor and Diana of Reland's jewellery was quite sort of spiky and quite sharp. Do you know what I mean? If we look through here, you see some, you see some pieces which are quite... Um, I mean, they're bold. They're very strong and bold. Very, very bold. Um, this sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So this is a sapphire and diamond necklace by Cartier. But uh, again, it, it's got points on the diamonds and they're sort of I mean, set like it's darts. Power. It's powerful, isn't it? Yes. Yes. And they're one or two quite big, chunky pieces that she wore. Uh, very modern, I mean, actually. Very modern. And not everybody could wear them. They would have looked ridiculous on some people. They would have. And looked, looked like, of, ah, this of, one. I mean, she had these incredible couture gowns that were backdrops, which were quite simple. With a little black dress. So almost a little black dress, thought. Yes. But um, this is a very iconic piece. We're looking at the um, gem set Latin crosses that she wore on the wedding day. I called it in my book, Vogue the Jewelry, the jewel that rocked a nation. Yes. Because this was made such a statement when they got married. And each one, each of these crosses has an inscription and each one means something to them, documenting the um, David 10th of 7th, 1936 in diamonds inscribed and dated. Get well cross from Wallace to David, inscribed and dated in platinum. So all these dates, God save the king for Wallace, all engraved on the back of these yes. gem set crosses. So it really did encapsulate the meeting, the love story, yes. the drama of the abdication and the, the wedding day. Finally getting there and he finally got Wallace. He did indeed. For better or worse. Yes. <laughs> Talking about her iconic jewels, we have to talk about the Panthers. Well, the Panthers are so amazing. Again, I've been lucky enough to... Um, you see, that's a pretty spiky looking... Piece, isn't it? And powerful. Uh, that Amethyst and diamond bib necklace by Cartier, which is huge, on a chain of Prince of Wales linking. So again, just affirming the royal connection there. But the Panthers, I have held a Panther as well. Yes. Because after the sale in 1987, the, the person who bought a, quite a few, about 12 pieces, then put them back for sale a few years Absolutely, ago. Absolutely, I remember that. Yes. And I put the Panther on my wrist. And it was the most flexible, yes. beautiful jewel. It literally, this panther's it's... paws flopped. Yes. Like it was just settling down for rest over your wrist. Absolutely, Absolutely. subtle, beautifully set. Slinky like a real panther. I mean, Very they're beautiful. They, they are really fantastically beautiful and timeless pieces, aren't they? They really are. Very articulated. And there was a documentary at the time, I think Susie Menkes, um, at the time of the sale, the original sale, mm -hmm. when you actually, they actually get them, you see them sort of moving middle of the screen and, and then they're just, they're almost real. And each one with a different expression. Yes. And of course the first one, I think, they, uh, they, they had a panther sitting on top of a large cabochon sapphire which was like 152 carats. I mean, absolutely extraordinary. Yes. And wearing this, she made a statement that every other social woman wanted a panther. Yes. And they wanted one. And they, they, they so of course, it created an entire style. That of course, yes. Cartier still, yes. still produces panthers. People still wear them. And mm. she worked, they worked very closely with Jean Toussaint on them. And significantly, she wore it the day that she met the royal family in public at the unveiling of the Queen Mary Memorial at Marlborough House, which was one of the things the Duke asked for was a, a public meeting or at any rate a, a recorded meeting with the royal family. And, you know, you can see that on, on film. 
then the Queen is there and the Queen Mother is there. And it, it was obviously designed to make it easier for, they knew the Duke wasn't going to live forever. And, you know, that at least they'd sort of acknowledged that they'd met her. And they'd met her privately a few times before, but this was a public meeting. One of the things he really asked for, very important that she wore that jewel. That is again. important. What do you think the message was there? Because now everyone looks at brooches the Queen wears the whole time to read some subliminal message. What do you think the message of her wearing that big cat? I just think it looked great. I think that's... I can't really <laughs> say more than that. I think it's a... I mean, once again, I mean, she is so stylish. She just got it right. It, it, it works very well with that. And of course, as a woman of a certain age, this is mink, isn't it? Or what is that? Is that mink that she's wearing? It probably is white mink. White mink around her neck, you know, so that she hides her neck, which, uh, you know... She was 70-something, so... So do you think this was one of the greatest collections? I do. I think it's an extraordinary collection. Um, as you know, I mean, the sale in Geneva in 1987, I mean, the prices just went through the roof. I mean, they were unbelievable. I mean, I can tell you that I, I spotted some type-ins, and I very rare moment in my life happened to have some money. So I multiplied the estimate by five, and the man at Sotheby's said, oh, you really want those? May I tell you, they went for £100,000 more than what I paid. <laughs> <laughs> my bid would have just been torn up long beforehand. Well, it, just it was everybody who was anybody wanted a piece from that set. Yes. Elizabeth Taylor, yes. um, Calvin Klein... I mean, the list was endless. Yes. Were, were those people visible at the sale or were they phoning in? Uh, well, I didn't go to the sale itself. I went to, to look at the preview, okay. but I think they were phoning in. I, don't think, I think one yeah. or two of them were there, but not, I don't think, Elizabeth Taylor, for example, no. She was by her pool in California, exactly. probably ringing. Yes. Yeah. She bought the Prince of Wales feathers, didn't yes, she? Yes, she did, she did. And I think Duchess of Windsor did keep contemporary um, in the fact that she then did wear costumes, she wore costumes. She loved yes. Kenny J. Lane, Kenny yes, she J. Did. Lane, the great yes. American costume jeweler. Yes. And um, in the sort of seventies and eighties, she wore his pieces. And before that, of course, Phil Covadura. Um, he would have come yes. in that category a bit, would he? No, he Not... was a fine jeweler. He's a he was a fine, fine jeweler. jeweler. Yes, but anyway, jeweler. she wore quite a lot of his too, as a lot of those women did. Those ladies of that era. I mean, he was quite, yeah. in a way, uh, he's quite um, avant-garde. Would you say he was very avant-garde, and yes. he wasn't trained. He had a sense of freedom in his yes. design. Started designing with um, Coco Chanel. Yes, and um, his pieces were amazing. A very different style and a very bold style as well. Yes, and wrapped hearts. And you said there was one particular piece that the Duchess always um, took when she was travelling, which was a heart yes. with two X's on to mark the Their 20th, 20th anniversary with yes. the Duke. Yes, and, and that was a piece that she always, whenever she was gay, that was one of the ones that was always insured and she took. And um, sometimes she wore it on a scarf on her neck and sometimes she wore it as a brooch. And I think I can find it here. I found it earlier on, definitely. There this it one. is. So it's an emerald, ruby and diamond brooch, Cartier, Paris, 1957, heart-shaped design and has the Roman numerals and Hugo even has a picture of her wearing it with a very 60s bouffant. Her hair had got slightly bigger at that stage, but still this elegant, chic, one-colour couture gown background with a scarf again. With a scarf again. With a scarf again. again, yes. And that was to commemorate their 20th wedding anniversary. So do you think that even without this royal provenance, it be a collection revered by art historians and jewellers alike for the extraordinary stones design and um, the fine jewellery making of that period. I do, but uh, and I think it's quite varied, isn't it? It's quite a wide variety of different things. You've got some very traditional, very sort of handsome, substantial jewels, and then you've got these fun pieces as well. So I think it covers a wide spectrum. I think it's rather exciting. Mm -hmm. And I guess always if there's a personal story, people have. Well, I think people do love that. I mean, they would say there's a story behind every jewel. It's not always a good story, but um, and people who have murdered, as you know, for jewels and the poor old Hope Diamond and everything um, has a hor horrendous story. Anyone who seems to own that seems to come to grief. But um, yes, I think people definitely were buying into the, the love story when they bought these jewels. They were the jewels that a, that a king gave to the wife for whom he gave up the whole of the British nation and the whole of the British Empire, which included in India and Australia and Canada and New Zealand. And it's an awful... And Diana Cooper said oh, when the Duchess died, what man ever gave up so much for one woman? Men don't tend to do that very often. In fact, perhaps almost never. He's the only one, really. Which is why that story, whether you agree with what my theories are or you have your own theories, it's still a fascinating story and it will mm -hmm. continue to be. 
what was really going on. And do you think, as we've slightly alluded to, that she went into great decline after his death, she was coercive controlled by her lawyer who started selling off her possessions without anyone knowing, there was no protection around because she had no family and close friends weren't allowed in. Do you think, if she'd been compass mentis at this point, do you think she would have left her jewellery to members of the royal family? Yes, I do. I think she was very keen to do what was ever, whatever was right. I'll tell you one story. She got on very well with the Queen. The Queen was very kind to her during the time of the funeral, said, you know, come, stay at Buckingham Palace, come to Windsor Castle, stay as long as you like, no pressure on you at all. Um, it was very important that she came, and she wasn't very well at the time, and it, was, it would have been awful if she hadn't come to the funeral. And um, when she then left, and she just this rather poignant pictures of her stepping up onto the plane. Um, shortly after that, Max Aitken, son of Lord Beaverbrook, wrote to Sir Godfrey Morley, her then lawyer, uh, the Duke's lawyer in London, and said, would the Duchess, would like to serialise the Duchess's memoirs and would she perhaps uh, contribute a few aperçus about what had happened? And Sir Godfrey Morley wrote to her and said, don't do that. Um, you also got on very well with the Queen. Uh, the British public were very sympathetic towards you. And this is exactly what you need your lawyer to hear, to say to you as a, as a widow. I look forward to coming to Paris shortly to inform you that you've been extremely well looked after. And you don't, as it were, need the money. And the Duchess wrote back saying, I've no intention of doing this. I don't want anyone making money out of the Duke's death, you know, which is quite sensible. Unfortunately, after that, she, she fell over and broke her hip and she was in hospital. And at that point, Metro Bloom moved in and persuaded her that Sir Godfrey Morley was stealing her money, which she absolutely wasn't, and basically took control. So then she fell into the hands of her Swiss banker, Monsieur Amiguet, uh, Metro Bloom, and then of course she had a dodgy doctor and a sly butler, and I mean she was in big trouble after that. And they kind of, as you rightly say, they well they just encircled her and kept people away. And when she went into the American hospital in 1975 with a very bad ulcer, she should have been allowed to die. And they patched her up and sent her home a wreck, and she lived for ten years, part of the time on a life support machine. At which point Metro Bloom altered everything. And if the Duchess had left, I saw a. A, a kind of a will that was made in the 50s, which was leaving a certain amount of things to different people. If there was a will, she, she overrode it. And even this one brooch in here, which has a WE on it, which um, the Duchess had actually given to Metro Bloom, and Metro Bloom put it into the Geneva sale as property of the Duchess and went for about £32,000, I think. It was awful what happened to her. Really, really awful. And you think, actually, she might have left the whole collection intact to the royal family? I don't know about that, but she might have left, left certain, pieces. certain pieces. I think that it was always said that she wanted to, the Princess Alexandra and the Duchess of Kent to have some things. And she was very fond of Prince Charles as well. I mean, she, she he was very kind to her and she, she really admired him and liked him and People love to say there was absolutely no contact at all between the British royal family and the Duke of Windsor after abdication. There was quite a lot of contact, actually, mm -hmm. one behind the scenes. And also, we, we discussed this um, at other times about how the Crown, programmes like the Crown on Netflix, mislead people about what actually happened. Because I think they showed on that when King Edward VIII was actually making the um, announcement to the nation that he was abdicating for the woman he loved. She was standing behind him oh. with a hand on her shoulder, which she wasn't at all. She certainly wasn't she the trouble. She was miles away in France. She was she? in France, and actually that was rather yeah. a pity because, of course, you see, they frightened her because they threw stones through her windows and the press was sort of pretty much doing this. And people, she got really scared and everybody thought she ought to leave the country. And that's a great pity because actually she was probably the one person who might have persuaded him not to abdicate. Mm -hmm. But she was stuck in France. The telephone lines were dreadful. When she listened to the abdication speech, we know from a report by Lord Brown, that she was cowering under a rug saying no 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 this must not happen she also thought he would be a good king and the queen mother to be fair to her thought he would be a good king you know there was a there was a lot of hope invested in him and he chucked it all away so don't believe everything you see in these films about the well don't believe anything you see in the crown it's absolutely outrageous <laughs> i mean the trouble with the crown is that it's lavishly produced well acted with good actors and beautifully filmed and it's completely dishonest I mean, they even have the duke of windsor as a sort of Shakespearean figure delivering sort of amazing lines and advising the present Queen. I'm sorry, no way. Absolutely not. So do you think she would have been sad that it was all dispersed all around the world to 
people who wanted a little bit of access to this, this love story. I don't know whether she thought like that. I can't tell you what she would have hoped for the collection. Um, unfortunately, none of us can really control what happens after we die, even if we make a very good will explaining things, because there are other people who move in and change the plans very often. So I don't know what she would have thought. But actually, hopefully some of the money went to the Louis Pasteur Institute and hopefully that might have done some good for people suffering from AIDS particularly, which was very much a thing of the time. But I mean, I don't think that was the Duchess's decision either, mm -hmm. to be honest. And there's been nobody in the royal family who will have such an avant-garde sense of wearing jewellery. Do no. you think again? No, there won't. No, I mean, mm -hmm. the Queen obviously has some wonderful jewels which come out from time to time. And the Queen Mother, of course, was left all Mrs. Greville's collection. And I mean, when she wore the, I mean, even in three strands of that five strand necklace. I mean, even if you weren't interested in jewels, you could not help looking at it. It was incredible. You know, the necklace, I mean, the Duchess of Cornwall wears five strands. Oh, quite yes, often these yes, days. yes. Queen Mother was quite mm -hmm. small because as the Queen Mother got older, she got smaller and smaller and the jewels got bigger and bigger in consequence. <laughs> you know. So it really is an extraordinary collection and you're very lucky to have this part of the inventory. Well, that was very as interesting to history. go through it and to see you know, to try to work out what got into the sale and what had been sold by Metro Bloom privately to people like um, Estee Lauder, for example. I mean, it's, I don't think I even found out the half of what was going on. What I did find out was um, enough to make you horrified. Mm. But the Panthers will live on, all these jewels will live on, they and live the, on. The, the positive parts of their story will stay in people's minds forever through yes, these jewels. They will, they will, and some people will still go on believing it was the great love story of the 20th century, and why not? It's the great jewel story. Of the yes, certainly it is. <laughs> Hugo, thank you so much for sharing that with us and your amazing knowledge about this woman. And we will look differently at her story now and the jewels, so thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes of If Jules Could Talk, please go to our website, carolwalton.com slash podcasts. And if you liked it, please share it any way that you can and subscribe to our podcast feed on any of the usual platforms where you find your podcast. And we'd love a rating and a comment. Please join us again in two weeks for the next Jeweled Nugget. And having been talking about diamonds in beautiful tiaras and historic pieces, we're actually going to talk about the future of diamonds, what young people think and what they're wearing and what will be the future of the diamond industry. We're going to be talking with the De Beers executive, Stephen Lucia, who's credited as shaping the soul of diamonds over the course of his 37 year career and Stephen Webster, the British jewelry designer. So please join me then. Goodbye. If Jewels Could Talk with Carol Walton is produced by Natasha Cowan, music and editing by Tim Thornton, graphics by Scott Bentley, illustration by Geordie Lavanda, and you can find me on Instagram at Carol Walton. Mm -hmm.